cool when you watch workout videos. Um, Dude, the drones are sketchy, man. I wanted to get one, but Those I just... Those things raise my heart rate like a thousand times whenever I'm flying in. Like, yeah, I, I, I just it. couldn't think of a good reason why I just spent 1200 bucks on it right now. I just felt like it wasn't a priority. Yeah. Well, Plus, they're nice. getting so much better, like with every... Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's. I have a, uh, I have a selfie stick. Yeah, it would be easy to yeah. like, prop that up. Yeah, that'd be great. They, they will. Don't ask why I have. Yeah, stick. don't ask. Why. I actually have one in my bag too. Yeah, nice. That no, same that, company, DJ. Uh, I just came out with this little thing called the Osmo. What is that? It's like this little handheld thing with like a ball camera, and it, I've heard it's kind of glitchy. Prop it up. But it's good yeah. Nice. It's fucking awesome. Thank you. But it's all uh, stabilized. Yeah, three axis can go. Oh, it's six hundred fifty dollars. This turns up what's your. 5488. And it's 4K. Really? And like water resistant. But I'm thinking like the next one should be full waterproof and like all the bugs will be worked out. So I'm, I don't want to get this first one yet. I'm so tempted because it's only a 650. Just get it, man. Ooh, live a little bit. Live. Yeah. Live, live a little bit. <laughs> what is it? It's like a three axis stabilized gimbal. It's so hard to get a good shot of yourself, you know? Yesterday. How's that? Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, gotcha. I don't, I don't want to look too. Uh, too needy, but I, I do want to see who's, who's it. Are we, are we? If you keep your hand just like that, you can't even tell you're holding it. Well, you don't have to. You don't have to do it <laughs> it's all the time. Of, it's a lot of work. You can set it down halfway through. Let's do it like that. Look at this. There we go. That'll work. Social media, man. Something like that. Okay. That's actually pretty good. Is that yeah. right? That's not bad. It's good. Both hands. Nice. All, all right. right. Cool. Action, you <laughs> Your you know what, you can, you can Why don't I, uh, yeah, yeah, you can put it up there. And you can just reach down. 15 minutes into it and just stop it. Okay, you just want a little bit of it. Oh. Yeah, I only want like 10 minutes of it, it's fine. If you're watching on Periscope right now, lots of hearts, go heart, 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 let us know that you're here and just write in where you're watching this from. We'll be on for the next 10, 15 minutes. Sweet, should I try to move it up? Yeah, 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 yeah move it up, yeah. And you gotta make this the same. Now I'm gonna find, yeah. So wallets are four, right? Just put it, put, put it good, man. I had the most epic. Do that. Oh, oh, there you go. Well, I mean, Without the thing, right? Night, it's dumped, like, almost three feet of snow. There you go. Hello. Perfect. Yeah. Woo, yeah. Great job. Yeah. Is that all right? Five, yes, four sir. Hours cool. You drove up there? Yeah. <laughs> I love this state. Oh, that, 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 that I know. Good. The state, that, right? that is, like, legit. Too legit to quit? Too legit to quit. You can quit, I guess. All right. I'm rolling. I don't think I'm ever gonna wear any other glasses. <laughs> Every time Mark video messages me, he always has his glasses. I'm like, what are these stupid fucking glasses you're wearing? Like, why are you still, why are you wearing these? It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Now I understand. Yeah. It's easier on the eyes. Yeah. Wow. Oh. <laughs> oh, so painful. Keep me out of the light. Yeah. I mean, oh. My God. <laughs> this is gonna make me a snob too. <laughs> oh, are we start? Are we starting? <laughs> We're on. Let's go. All right. Welcome to the uh, the Rich Twenty Something podcast. We're back with our friend James Swanick, and we're matching today with our glasses, at least. We are. Um, they look so, good on you too. Thank you so much. So James just gave me. A, okay. So just a quick backstory. If you guys haven't watched, I don't know what episode. What is episode? You don't know what episode this is. Is it like seven or eight? Six. You can talk. Oh, yeah. this is <laughs> this is seven. Six was the one you guys were talking okay, about. Okay, so this is seven. Six, yeah. Episode six is with our mutual friend Mark. And Mark talked a lot about uh, sleeping, sleep habits and nutrition and total body optimization. And he talked about these blue blocking glasses. And James has a company that makes these glasses. And now I'm wearing them. And I don't think I'm going to take them off. I'm uh, bad, man. Pretty, I like, if you guys, I don't want to, you know, pimp this too much. What's the, where can they get these? Yeah, if you go to swanwicksleep.com. Yeah, you can grab them there. Um, follow it on Instagram as well. Swan Week Sleep. S W A N W I C K Sleep. This is like blatant yeah. product placement. Right at the beginning. I'm wearing. No, the thing is, if you take these glasses off, the whole world looks a lot harsher. Really, it's it's nice. It's, it's a joy to wear this. Okay, okay. Let, let, let's get to the let's get to the actual. Let's get to the nitty gritty now. No more plugs. <laughs> no more plugs. Um, all right, James. Where, where do we where do we meet? We met. We've known each other for maybe two years now. Yeah, I think we were introduced by Manish Sethi, ah, yeah. the creator of Pavlok, who yes. is, is a good friend of ours. Yeah. I, I feel like I feel like I'm always wearing my friend's things. I have a Manish's tattoo on my arm. I'm wearing <laughs> your glasses. Like this is becoming a trend. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with. <laughs> like I just take a little piece of all my friends. Well, you've surrounded yourself with the top people. Yeah, in your, you know? it's obviously top. rubbing off on you. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> um, so Manish introduced us, and then depends on how long you've been watching this podcast or reading my stuff, following me, but I actually did an interview with 
with James when I was working at this show called The Lift TV, and um, and we talked a little bit uh, on that on that broadcast about his his beginnings. But a, a lot of you guys haven't seen that, so I want to take it back and rewind a little bit. And uh, James is a is a former ESPN Sports Center anchor, and he has an incredible story about how he got to that point. Um, and I just want to get a little bit of background on you, James, and kind of like how you got to this point. Sure. Well, I'm Australian, as you can tell from my funny accent. What? Yeah, no, crazy. No. I was thinking British, <laughs> obviously from Scotland, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I was I grew up in Brisbane, Australia, and I was a, a newspaper reporter journalist um, from age 17 through 23. Kind of hustled my way into a copy boy position when I was 17, and then you know went through the ranks. 23, I moved over to London, was a sports journalist there. Moved to Los Angeles in 2003. And started interviewing uh, movie stars, celebrity uh, like celebrities like Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Tom Cruise, and started you know sending those interviews back to Australia and England all, all over the world. Created a PR company, lost that in 2008, 2009 when the whole world financial world went into Armageddon. Um, you know, went out down to Argentina and Colombia and the Spanish speaking. Oh, countries. You make it sound so cool. Everything is just so breezy for you. Well, Hang on, I did run away to Argentina after I lost my PR company, okay. so it was like more so, like I was going there to lick my wounds. It wasn't a vacation. Well, I mean, it was a voca vacation, but it was more like, just get me out of this life. i got to go and just chill out and try to learn some Spanish and dance with some Spanish-speaking girls. That still seems a little bit... <laughs> it still seems pretty pretty breezy, but okay. Uh, and then, yeah, 2010, I became a sports center anchor on ESPN. I also quit drinking alcohol. I wasn't, deal, yeah. I wasn't a big drinker, but I just decided to... To quit for 30 days I felt amazing and then I just continued on and you know now I'm very much focused on my health and optimizing my life and productivity and been living in this fine country for 12 years and long may it continue didn't you uh didn't you like officially become a, a dual citizen recently I did yeah two years ago it was pretty uh, funny at the yeah. ceremony they make you um they make you renounce your your renounce I thought you're a dual citizen, though. No, I am a dual citizen. Well, hang on. In the eyes of Australia, my native country, I am definitely Australian. But in the eyes of the American <laughs> government, I'm only American. <laughs> so in this in this naturalization ceremony, they make you stand up and say this thing. And part, one of the lines is, I hereby renounce my, my citizenship <laughs> to my native country. So and that, as I said this, I had my fingers crossed behind my back. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not giving up Australia that easy. <laughs> Psych. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's very American. I feel like that's extremely American of us. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's right. like, you are no longer Australian. Yeah. You're now one of us. And one you of us... pledge only. allegiance yes. to the flag. That's, if, you, if you actually like recite the American pledge and you really think about it, it's kind of creepy. It is, but... But I tell you, I, I did pledge allegiance to the flag, but I also continued to pledge allegiance to my Australian heritage. Do they, is there like an Australian pledge? Well, no, there isn't. No, no. I was born in Australia. It's not, oh, you mean if you go in yeah, there and you become a citizen? Yeah, I think you just got to rattle off like the, the Australia's greatest sports athletes and name them and what or how many runs they scored in cricket. If you can get that right, they go, yeah, you're one of us. You got, or they'll give, us, they'll give you six beers and go, if you can drink six you, beers in an hour, right. you're one of us. Did, well, but they don't have like a thing that like like school kids do every morning. Is that just an American thing? Oh uh, well, they, yeah, they at school assembly they'll play the Australian national anthem and raise the flag. Sure. You guys do like like we have to do this whole thing where like hand on our hearts every morning since starting at five years old. I pledge allegiance to yeah. the flag. We're not as we're not as uh, it's, strict on it's that. Fucking cultish. And if you don't, there have been a lot of instances where if you don't do it, people get really upset. Yeah. Like. And if you put the, the American flag on the ground... Don't ever like, do that. It's like the worst thing never, ever, right? Never, I mean, there are, people will come out in their Ford F-150s and they will just, they'll just terrorize you. It's a you fascinating know? thing, isn't it? I mean, it's good marketing, I'll tell you. Yeah. It's, the, the American government is doing a great job at marketing the wonders that is America. Because even, like, even... <laughs> like, did you watch that TV show, The Newsroom, with... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There was, in the, the opening scene of that whole series, and Jeff Daniels is, plays this anchor, he just rips into America, right? And he says... We're like, uh, who says America is the greatest country in the world? We're like seventh in, in uh, literacy. We're like the fattest nation on earth. Uh, we, we owe like more money than any other civilized nation known to man. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. And everyone's like, oh, oh my God. That's a really, yeah. Oh my God. And oh my God, it's not American. But it's true and it's fact. And this, but let me say this this country is amazing and it's been so good to me and I love it unreservedly. But the American government does a terrific job at feeding Americans that 
America is the greatest country sure. in the world. And it, and it isn't on, on many levels. On many levels, it really is not. On some levels, it absolutely is. But marketing, great job, American government. I feel, I feel like America is one of those football dads who was like a high school or a college superstar. And then, you know, like eventually he slowly got a little bit older and fatter, but he was still talking about the glory days. <laughs> yeah. And maybe you can still even bust the move once in a while. But, you know, like we know. We know that China is getting older and, you know, into adolescence now. We know that other countries are well surpassing. You know? Yeah, but I still get chills when I when I sing the Star Spangled Banner. No, you don't. I, I really do. Really? Australia has an awful anthem. It's not very, you know, it doesn't it stir your emotions. But the Star Spangled Banner, absolutely. God Save the Queen and the Marseille. Uh, is it the Marseille? The, what's the French no, national anthem? Allons au fond de la patrie, le jeu de quoi est arrivé. I think it's the Marseille, Marseille or something, I don't know. Anyway. I mean, black people get chills for the Star Spangled Banner too, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different reasons. We were also naturalized, uh, at least half of my family was. Um, you know, one of your stories I like the most, um, and I think that people can relate to, you had this period of time where you just moved from, I think, because you, you moved from... Brisbane to London to the States, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, there was this period of time where um, you were in a, in a hostel in Redondo? Was it, or, or Hermosa? Hermosa Beach, yeah. So Hermosa Beach is um, it's in California here. And James had just moved to the States. And you were... Because you made it sound really... People fucking hate when you're like, oh, I just moved here. I started interviewing celebrities. And then everything was good. I started a PR company. We made a couple million dollars. And then I was a little sick of that. So in Argentina. People don't relate to that shit. Like they, I want to know about the nitty-gritty struggle. You were in the, you were in the hostel... And things weren't working. What was going on back? So you want to know the struggle. Yeah. Okay, well, let me tell you. The struggle started about a month before I left London when my girlfriend broke up with me. Oh, okay. And that was really the trigger and the catalyst for me to come to America in okay. the first place. This is a little wrong with you. Give us the emotion. <laughs> anyway, I had to get out of London. I was like, oh, man, I'm so depressed over this girl. So I flew to, Lo to Los Angeles on September 30th, 2002. You remember it. I do remember it because it was the Australian Rules uh, Grand Final night. <laughs> the Australian Football League Grand Final night. And I flew in and I went to a, to the Cock and Bull pub on Lincoln down there in Santa Monica. I know Monica. exactly where that is. And uh, I went in and it was full of Australians, right? Because they're all Australian expats in Los Angeles all watching this Australian... Fantastic. Every day. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I went in there and I just made some new friends, Aussie friends. And these two guys said, oh, there's a party down in Hermosa Beach tomorrow. You should come down. I said, okay. Now, that night I was sleeping in the Santa Monica hostel paying 15 bucks a night. Anyway, I went down to Hermosa Beach. It's about 40 minutes south of Los Angeles Airport. Mm -hmm. I checked into the Surf City Hostel, which is right on Pier Avenue there on, on the beach. And I went into a bunk bed with six other snoring backpackers from around the world where I lived for the next 90 days and 90 nights, paying 15 bucks a night. I worked on a job site up in Bel Air with these uh, Australians who paid me $75 cash a day. And during that time, I was like, how the hell am I going to live in this country long term? Like, how am I going to make this happen? So what I figured out was uh, I'd been a journalist, I'd been a reporter. Hollywood and Los Angeles is where all the celebrities are. Let's figure out a way that I could interview movie stars and make a living from it. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I reached out to all these movie studios, Sony Pictures, uh, Fox, uh, Warner Brothers, and I just cold called them. Literally just cold called them and said, hey, I'm a journalist, uh, I want to come and uh, interview movie stars, how do I do it? One uh, publicist from Sony Pictures returned my call and invited me to come in to the studio. That's and, super rare. Uh, very rare, and meet with her. Her name was Anna Whelan in the, in the uh, publicity department. I went in there and she told me how it all works. She told me this is, you need to get a magazine who'll publish your story. You need to prove that you'll be able to get lots of readers who'll read the interview. This is how it works. And I went, great. So anyway, two weeks later, I am come back from my job site. I'm all dusty and dirty from you know working on the job site. I, I'm in the hostel foyer and there's an internet machine. And, and it's one of those old internet machines machine. where you stick a dollar in and it gives you seven minutes of internet time. <laughs> Do you remember this? This yeah, is like yeah. 2002. Not that long ago, actually. It wasn't that long yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I get an email from this woman, Anna, at Sony Pictures, and she says, Hi, James, it's Anna. We met two weeks ago. I've got an opportunity um, for you to interview Jack Nicholson next week for the movie Anger Management. Would you be interested? And I was like, <laughs> hell yeah, I'd be interested. <laughs> and two weeks later, literally, I went from the job site in Bel Air. I borrowed the, 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 the construction van from my colleague, <laughs> drove down to the Armitage Hotel in Beverly Hills on Burton Way, I went into the bathroom in the foil level. I sort of splashed some water on, put a nice shirt, shirt on, some other pants. Went up to the penthouse suite and I sat down with Jack Nicholson for 20 minutes and interviewed him about his life, his career, 
and it was amazing. And that was the beginning of me interviewing movie stars for about the next six years. That's amazing. You know, the thing I like about that is that obvious. I mean, you didn't even have a, you didn't even have even a family here. So what what that kind of says to me is that all of us have the opportunity to have a sort of like a lucky break. Mm -hmm. It's not like um, because because. When you talk about your success now, people will say, well, yeah, but you had all these things preceding it that makes it easier for him. But but even in the beginning, if you really assert yourself, you can make your own luck in a way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it was, I want to live in this country. I've got to find the way. I'm not waiting around for something to happen. I'm going to make this happen. So I literally just like, well, how can I do this? Where do I start? Okay, I'm going to start by making a plan. I'm going to call Fox, Sony. Warner Brothers, Universal, DreamWorks, and I'm just gonna call and say, who do I talk to about this? Yeah. Wait for someone to put you through. Try and convince the other person on the line. One person called me back, Sony Pictures. That's all it took. That's all it took. Yeah. And then because I managed to get that interview with Jack Nicholson, I had to wait, I had to do the interview, had to type it up, I had to send it off to this magazine in England called Loaded Magazine, which is kind of like a British version of, of Maxim, if you like, right? I had to wait two months for them to actually publish the article and then I had to wait another month for them to send the magazine to me in Los Angeles so I could then walk it up to the Kinko's on Pacific Coast Highway, photocopy it 20 times, and then send it out to the studios that did not return my call, Fox, Warner Brothers, Universal, and say, hey, I interviewed Jack Nicholson for Sony Pictures. Here's my article. Would you like me to interview your stars and promote, promote uh, you know, your movies? Next thing I know, I've got Universal on the phone saying, hey, would you like to interview Arnold Schwarzenegger for Terminator 3? which was his final movie yeah. that he did before he became uh, yeah, right. the governor. Then I had that published. Then it was like, oh, can you interview Ben Stiller and Jennifer Aniston for the movie Along Came Polly? And then it just kind of snowboard from there. Now, I was still doing the construction work for 75 bucks cash a day <laughs> for like three, four, five months after I did that until that time where I started to get paid, I started to get the ball rolling. Then I said, I'm not going up to Bel Air to do that crap anymore. Now I'm going to do this. And then I became you know, a full-time celebrity interviewer. That's that, that's so cool because I think that it's easy to underestimate the power of having one connection. We were talking earlier before we started shooting about me doing this whole book deal thing. Mm. And even even in that experience, it's been just one or two key connections that have led from me having no influence or anything to me getting a six-figure book deal. Yeah. It's just like it's like one or two key conversations. Yeah. You don't, you don't need to have like a network of a bunch of shitty people. You just need like one or two good people in your network. You really do. <laughs> I mean, it's good to ha it's good to go out there and and I don't like the word network. I like the yeah, word yeah, connect. Yeah. Like I like to go out there and connect. It's good to connect with a lot of people, but the quality or the caliber of the conversation or the relationship you have is far superior to knowing just a lot of people. You know. Yeah, yeah. And here's the other thing: the person who ultimately leads to the breakthrough for the most part, isn't a really close friend or someone you've got an amazing relationship with. A lot of times it's just an acquaintance. Yeah. It's someone that you just had a had good Someone's rapport with, with on one occasion. Yeah. Someone liked you, you, you got into a conversation for five, ten minutes, maybe an hour, whatever, and then you called them up and said, hey, I remember you were, you were working in, in book publishing. Who was that literary agent that, that you worked with? Oh, Christy, you should talk to Christy. I'll connect you. Thank you so much. That'd be great. How can I help you? Well, you know what, I'm trying to um, lose a little bit of weight at the moment as an example. Oh, you know what, my friend Mark Dharma, who has this amazing program, I should connect you with him, maybe you'd be interested in that. Thank you so much. The rule of reciprocity comes in, right? One thing we know about human psychology is that, you know, we, when someone does a favor for someone, we instinctively want to do a favor back for that person. Absolutely. So in anything in life, it doesn't mean that you need to know 100 people to get ahead. You only need to know one person as long as you are genuine and you're connecting with that person and you're trying to help that other person, they're always going to want to help you and that's where you'll get the breakthrough. That's that's such a good insight and I'm wondering now, you were really like very hungry when you came to the States and you wanted to make things happen for yourself. Do you find that as you get more success, you get less hungry and it, or it gets harder to like reach really hard for your goals? No, I, I think if anything, I'm hungrier. Hungrier? Yeah, it's... it's, it's um, you know, I, I'm in a really interesting phase now where I've, I've just kind of broken the back of online marketing and selling um, information products and really helping people. And the more success I get, the more success I want to get, and the, 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 the higher my, my goals become. So, so if you can help one person, all of a sudden you then want to help five people, then you want to help 10 and 100 and 200 and so forth, right? 
you get one Instagram follower, and then you want to get 5,000, yeah, yeah. and you go, I really want to get to 10,000, and then you get to 10,000, you're like, not enough. It's not enough. I need yeah. 12,000 tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> There's no, it's, 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 but almost that, it's almost <laughs> annoying. It's almost annoying sometimes for me personally to never be 100% fulfilled. It's, Ooh. it's a really tough situation because I had this conversation with a good friend of mine a while ago, which was every win that you have, like every goal you see, so every win is also a loss. Which sucks because you get to that point, right? And then you're like, hmm, now I've got to go again. What's the next goal? Yeah. So you lost the satisfaction of having a goal to achieve because you just achieved it. Correct. And the the intensity and the allure is always, for me, at the highest point right before I achieve what I want. Right. Like when I was at on Instagram, 99.9. Yeah, yeah. And I get to 100 and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But you know what's interesting? There's a great book called The Happiness Hypothesis I, by I Jonathan Haidt. I haven't read it yet. It's, it's amazing. It's probably in my top three books. And he says, uh, they've done all these studies <clears throat> of the brain, of people's happiness over time. And this is one thing that's absolutely true. You are happier chasing the goal and moving forward towards the mm. goal and making progress towards the goal then you are actually achieving the goal. Human beings need to be making progress, okay? So as long as you are going like this and you're always moving forward, you will be the happiest that you can be. If you're moving forward, then you achieve the goal and then, you, then you're stuck there. Even if it's a million dollars, right? Let's just use an example. And yeah. you've got there and you stay like that, your, your happiness level will go down. In fact, they've also proven like if uh, uh, people who win the lottery, they say they win $10 million. Yeah. Um, and someone who becomes a, a quadriplegic, right, loses the use of their legs in a car crash, for example. Um, they've done studies that six to 12 months after both of those, those events happen, the, uh, both of those party uh, resort back to the same level of happiness they had from when the incident happened. Yeah. So you might think that making $10 million or having a huge win is incredible, and yeah, you're going to get a spike, right? You're going to get a spike in your happiness level, but ultimately that's going to come back down again. Likewise, with the um, with the quadriplegic or the paraplegic, I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but depression for three months, right? But then all of a sudden, now you've got a goal to walk again or to to at least have a you know some kind of comfort. social life. Or... Yeah, exactly. You, as long as you're making progress, your happiness level comes back up again. So it's not the goal; it's not achieving the goal that gives you the most happiness. It's the, as long as you're making progress towards that goal. So. Just to, just to sort of wrap that thought up, um, the perfect way to live life really is to always be progressing uh, in terms of happiness, perfect way is what I mean, um, and not be so, so hell-bent on, on achieving or not achieving the goal because even when you get that, it doesn't give you this huge explosion awesome. of, of satisfaction that you think it does. That's so, that's so weird because um, just recently with the, with the whole book thing, mm -hmm. and which I can tell you guys more about later in another podcast, I can explain the whole process. And we talked about it a little yeah. bit. So, I mean, for years I wanted to do a book, and then I got to the point where it was like, it was possible, I got an agent, that was cool, we started doing these meetings, I'm like, this is really gonna happen, this might happen. Mm -hmm. And the day that I got the, like, we closed the deal, I actually felt a little bit sad. Really? It was, yeah, I was, like, I got off the phone, yeah. I was like, yeah, and then I, I was actually kind of depressed that day. And it, like it was a good amount of money and it was like a big accomplishment. Everyone was like, are you pumped? Are you so excited? I was like, <sighs> you know, and, and I was trying to think in my head, I'm like, well, what I've been, what I feel better now if it was more money or what I feel better now if it was, if, if it was a, like, if I was already a New York Times bestseller, like what would make me feel happy? And I realized it, it was more like the pursuit is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And, and so maybe that's something that we should realize before we're on our deathbed, right? Like yeah. once you're on your deathbed, you'll probably realize that it was never about the goal. Yeah, you know, so absolutely. Maybe start thinking about that now. Yeah. I mean, I, I struggle with this. All, I mean, struggle is not the right word, but I go back and forth in my brain about like what gives me the most happiness. And I sometimes I'll go through a phase where it's like, I don't make enough money. I haven't got enough people following me on Instagram. My 30-day no alcohol challenge isn't big enough yet. I only spoke at Dave Asprey's Bulletproof <laughs> Conference <laughs> this year. That's not enough. That's not enough. Why haven't I got a TED Talk yet? Versus like... You just spoke at Dave Asprey's Bulletproof Conference. You've just changed the lives of hundreds of people to, to, to encourage them to reduce or quit alcohol. You were at 1,000 Instagram followers two months ago, and now you're at 15,000. Yeah. You wake up healthy. Your family's all alive. When is it enough? Like, 
It's not like I'm, I'm a healthy guy. I eat well. I can afford to eat good food. I've yeah. got good education. I can read books. Like this. <laughs> What you else do you mean? want? What else do you want? It's like, we're so spoiled. <laughs> we're so spoiled, right? We sleep on a pillow top mattress. The, the room is conditioned to the perfect temperature. <laughs> to wake up in the morning. We're a bunch you know? of pussies. Yeah, we're a bunch of pussies. We're actually turned into a bunch of pussies. We used to sleep on rocks. You know, <laughs> rocks and sticks and cover ourselves with leaves. Now I, now I like, I quibble at, at a water temperature that's too cold. In the morning. <laughs> ooh, ooh. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. I've been taking cold, I took a cold shower for the first time today. It was miserable. I was fine. It was good. Like, I... Were you the one who told me to do this? You took a cold shower for the first time today? Yeah. Well, I mean, not the first time in my whole life. Right. But, like, I'm getting trying to get into it. Yeah. You know? So what I do, maybe it was Mark Darman who told Mark, you about Mark, it. Mark was telling me about it, too. Yeah. A so what, what I do is I'll get in and I'll start at hot, and then I'll go to cold at the end of Wait, it. Wait. Were you criticizing me just now when you said it was your first time? Was that, like, a critical... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it really was. Okay. Yeah. Because I would have thought that a man of such, you know, productivity <laughs> and insight would have known this I'm stuff. I'm a pussy! Right now. I don't want to do it! It's not fun! You're it's not, not that fun. much of a pussy. I've seen you dead, deadlift yeah. 500 pounds. Uh, well, yeah, check that out. YouTube me. <laughs> um, but, but, so you, oh, you start hot though. You start hot and go cold. Well, I've done, I've done all kinds. Ben Greenfield is a friend of mine. He's yeah, he's ben guy. Greenfield Fitness. He says for, for fat loss, the best thing to do is go hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. So you get in the shower, do 20 seconds hot, and then 10 seconds That's cold. 20 seconds hot, 10 seconds cold. Um, he only takes cold showers all the time, right? Yeah. Tony Robbins, the motivational coach, always uh, takes a cold plunge every morning if he's staying at his place um, to reduce inflammation. It wakes you up. It's it really, really good. I was, I was, you know why it wakes me up? Because I was a little bit angry afterwards. I was like, oh, it's angry. Right. It kind of woke me up. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. Like, if the best time to take a hot shower <laughs> is at night time because then you relax. So you know when you take a steam bath, you're like, oh, you get really sleepy and you're tired. Good time to take a hot shower is at night time. Really but in the time. morning, when you want to wake yourself up and you want to like get all the blood flowing through the system and you want to be energized and fresh, cold water. But it's no fun when you just go cold. I always warm up. To, I always start with warm and then I switch it on to cold for the last like 30 seconds and then I get out and I feel, oh yeah, it was good. It's amazing. See, Mark told me, Mark told me to just put it on freezing cold and put your head in there and go. Yeah, well, that's, that's what that works as well. I did that. I did Mine's that. only half pussy. <laughs> I was so I put it on cold this morning. I was just trying to get my head in there, trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And I just ah, I stepped in. And I was going ah, and Sarah's like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "I'm fine, fine. It's just cold water." She thought I was doing something else, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. I mean, it's it's. Um, I think part of it is just like mentally being able to mentally challenge yourself. Yeah, you know, to, to, like first thing in the morning, you're already accomplishing your goals. You're, you're tackling obstacles. This is hard. I did this already. Yeah, can do other things. Well, here, here's some some little productivity tips I've learned for first thing in the morning. Make your bed first thing in the morning, right? Because oh, it sounds so weird, but there, there's actually a great YouTube video from this Navy SEAL who went back to the University of Texas, which is a Longhorn, is it University yeah, of Austin? Yeah, and um, he was uh, saying that the, all the Navy SEALs, the first thing they do in the morning is make their bed. And what that does is that it triggers into your brain a win right away in the first minute, mm -hmm. a success. So now when I wake up, I'll just quickly get up and I'll make my bed even though I'm like, ugh. And so every time I walk back into my room now, I see the bed made and the visual of that, and I, oh, that's a win. Wow, I'm efficient. I'm making I've already done something. Up. Exactly. The other thing I do is I put my workout clothes at the end of the bed the night uh, before I go to sleep. So when I wake up in the morning, I see the, the, the view of my clothes. There's no way I'm not going to put them on. I have to actually step over them to go and use the bathroom. So there's no way I can't see it. Yeah. So I'll instinctively put my workout clothes on, which 99% of the time will, will make me create the habit of going to the gym, even on those days where I don't really want to go. Which is most days. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I still go, but I just, most mornings I don't wake up and go, oh, I can't wait to work out. Yeah. You know, sometimes I like it, but yeah. like, sometimes, sometimes you have to force yourself to go and you don't want to. Well, you know, uh, there's a little hack to that as well because what I get addicted to is not working out in the gym. What I get addicted to is the hour after I've been working out in the gym when the endorphins are flowing through oh, yeah, and yeah, when yeah, you're yeah. eating that breakfast and you're having that drink. Yeah, and yeah. so when I don't want to go to the gym, in my mind, I look forward an hour and a half, two hours to that time and that moment where I've showered, I'm exhausted, but I'm making my breakfast or I'm eating that breakfast or I'm sitting out in the sun having a coffee or whatever it is post-workout yeah. and then I'm imagining like this morning for example like what I got on today right I'm meeting Daniel at 11 okay uh, sorry at 1 I got these other things I want to make sure that when I'm doing that interview I feel amazing so it was a lot easier for me to like go to the gym this morning even though I could have taken a day off and right now I feel amazing I'm still getting the benefits of those endorphins it's true yeah I mean even with the 
even with jujitsu, which I do every day, every morning, five days a week, um, I a lot of times I'll get up and I'll be like, you know, I don't feel like getting choked today. It's just not, <laughs> it's not like top of my list. But yeah. as soon as I get in there, like 20 minutes into it, I'm like, man, this is, this is really great. I'm feeling like super, I'm, I'm feeling strong, I'm feeling flat, fast, flexible, I'm feeling right. good about my life. And, you know, I get home and then the rest of the day is set. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it always it always feels better, you know, once you get into it. But it's not, I think I think one of the take homes for me on that is that so, sometimes you play mental games with yourself and it will help. But other times you just have to do things just to maintain your consistency. Right. You know, sometimes you will be in the gym and it won't be an optimal day, but you just go in there so you don't skip a day. It, it's all consistency. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, since about five years ago when I quit drinking, just for health reasons, I became very health conscious. Like, I started focusing on paleo and how heavy my weight should be and how often I should do it and sleep and all those kind of things. The reason why I feel like feel so amazing today in terms of my physical health is that I've been consistent over five years. Yeah. And that consistency is at least four or five times a week exercising. And the way I stay consistent is that the benefits of working out consistently far outweigh um, you know, not, not, not doing it, right? Sure. And I get addicted. It's not, a, it's not that I'm, I'm using the word addicted a little bit too flippantly because it, it assumes that I have an addictive personality. But I love feeling good all the time so much that I make consistent exercise a must. It's not a should, mm -hmm. it's a must, right? It's a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. If there's an important business meeting, I'll skip it because, or I won't skip it, I'll find another way to do you'll, it. You'll make it happen. I'll make it happen, but the non-negotiable is daily exercise. And because of that, I feel great. You know, so it's kind of like, I was just, you know, I have a YouTube channel, it's James Swanick, and last week I consistently put up a video every day, but then guess what? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's now Wednesday, I haven't put up a video, and I'm angry at myself because I haven't remained consistent. Yeah. And because of that, my viewer numbers don't go up, they just stay the same. Um, so I know, like, you have to be consistent with everything, consistency is king. So, so that's, I'm curious now, when you were talking about the past five years really optimizing your health. What's going on with this, this no drinking thing? Like this is part of the the movement that you're creating, um, and I'm, I'm curious to know what what this is, what this is about. Well, I was always just a social drinker. You know, I drank uh, a few beers during the week, a bit more on the weekend. Sometimes I get drunk, and it was a lot of fun. There was nothing too crazy. I was not an alcoholic, although everyone suspects that you are when you say you don't right, drink. Right, yeah, yeah, right? everyone thinks that. Everyone's always like so suspect. Especially right? being Australian, there's stereotypes about Australians drinking a lot. Right, yeah. right. And, and actually, last time I was in Vegas, I was hanging out with a bunch of Aussies and they fucking crushed it. I mean, they were really good at drinking. Yeah, we do it's drink a lot really as, like, as, a, as a nation. As a culture, Yeah. I don't know if that's everyone, but damn. Yeah. Yeah, we do, we do. We do drink a lot. But look, and I there were times when I drank a lot, and there were yeah. times, and it was fun as hell, quite frankly. However, I got to about 35, 34, 35, I'm 40 now, and um, you know, I put on a bit of weight slowly but surely. I got sick and tired of feeling sick and tired from hangovers. I was sleeping in till 10 or 11 at night, uh, in the morning rather. Um, my skin was really dry. I did. I just looked in the mirror and I was just felt really mediocre and average. Like I was just existing in the world. That's almost worse than feeling bad. Feeling mediocre is almost worse. Yeah. Because it just means you're not really trying at all. Right. Yeah. So it was just. It wasn't like. It wasn't like I was. My life sucks. It's so terrible. It was. I was just blah. Like a five out of ten. Oh. Right. And so. I took a 30 day break. Well, actually what happened was is that I woke up with a hangover in Austin, Texas, right? I was at the South by Southwest uh, festival and I had two gin and tonics the night before only. It was free drinks from the bar. It was a party going on. I woke up, had this terrible hangover. Um, and I, and I went to have a hangover breakfast in an international <laughs> house of pancakes, the IHOP, the best place to do it. And, uh, I went in there and I sat down and in IHOP they have photos of the food that you eat on the menu it's delicious. and these big bright colors of like pancakes and maple syrup and eggs and bacon and because I was hung over I had a headache and I was tired I was like oh that just looks horrendous <laughs> and then I look over to the right there's a guy who couldn't have been less than 500 pounds right and he's just tucking into this all you can eat <laughs> like pancakes i'm looking out the window there's a freeway on the right hand side it's dark and gloomy it's like 10 o'clock in the morning i'm like this is the pits man like this sucks 
And I was like, I got to change here. Cameras, like, I, mean, I think this happened to Cameras before. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is just life story. So I was like, I, you know what? I, I, I'm just, I'm just going to take a break from alcohol. I'm just going to yeah. see if I can do 30 days. I'm going to just go for 30 days, right? <laughs> and it was just to see if I could do it, you know? And so I just went. So after seven days, I was like, damn, I'm sleeping pretty good here. I feel a lot clear, clear mind, a lot better. After 14 days, I said, wow, I think I've lost a little bit of weight here. Day 21, I started getting up earlier on a Saturday and Sunday, like 7 or 8 in the morning, started exercising, going to the gym. And after 30 days, I'd lost 13 pounds of fat in 30 days. And all I'd done was just stop drinking alcohol. But it wasn't just not drinking alcohol. It was I wasn't eating the late night burger or fries or the kebabs because, you know, you, you do yeah, with alcohol. Yeah. I'd saved all this money and everything was just like, whoa, I feel pretty damn good right now. So I went... I'll see if I can do 40 days. Then I was like, I wonder if I can do 50 days. Then after about 60 days, I'm like, you know what? I'm starting to hang out with a high caliber of person now. I'm starting to have deeper conversations. Oh my God, I'm still attracting women <laughs> and I'm not drinking. Yeah. And not only am I attracting women, but I'm attracting like a Man. high caliber <laughs> of women. I see where you're going there. That was clever. I see what you did there. Um, so I just kept going. I just kept going. And I went for, I went for one year. I was back in Austin. I went into the Luster Pearl Bar on Rainy Street in Austin, and I went and ordered a Budweiser. I'm like, I'm going to drink this damn beer. I'm going to celebrate one year without drinking. And I went to get the yeah, beer. celebrate one year without drinking with a drink. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Right, to celebrate, because I still equated the alcohol with celebration, right? Yeah. As society does. And I went to put it to my lips, and I smelt it, and it smelled bloody good. It really did. Like, it smelled, ooh, that smells good. But something stopped me. I just put it back down. I slid it back over the table to the bar, and I said, you know what? Give me water ice and a piece of lime instead. And I drank the water and I haven't touched a drop of alcohol since. And I feel amazing. Since then, I became a sports center anchor on ESPN. I achieved that lifelong goal. Um, my that health was, has improved. I didn't know that the, the ESPN sports center thing happened while you were in the transition of not drinking. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So that was one of the reasons. Like, I'm convinced I wouldn't have got that job if I, if I had still been drinking. Not that I was drinking a lot. But not drinking gave me so much more clarity and so much more focus and so much more energy that when the opportunity to become a sports center anchor on ESPN presented itself, I went for it. I had clarity, energy, focus, and I just went, I am going to make this happen. And I did it. I wasn't waking up hungover like, oh, maybe I'll call that producer today. Or oh, it's a no big deal if I get it or if I don't get it. It was like, I'm making this happen. That's really smart. Um, do you find that it, that in the beginning you were maybe lacking confidence because it's such a social crutch? I mean, massively. Yeah. I mean, drinking alcohol, people think they can't go out if they're not drinking. They think sure. they can't fit in if For they're sure. not drinking. They think they can't walk up to a pretty girl if you're a guy and, and if you're not drinking. So yeah, I had those, those doubts. But you know what? After like 30 days, after like doing it and after just getting used to going out, I realized it's all just in the brain. It's all a nonsense that you like... Like, I have more fun now, I dance more, I sing more, I uh, have the most fun of most people at a party. Well, I have the most fun of anyone at the party, I should say, from not drinking. I'm pretty sure that your singing isn't as good without My drinking. singing sucks, quite frankly. <laughs> so you probably shouldn't listen to me sing at any time. But the point is, is that once you realize you don't need it, your whole world opens up. You save money, you have more energy, your skin looks better. Here's a warning, okay? If you just quit drinking for 30 days... You will get better looking. I'm warning you, you will get better looking. <laughs> so I'm warning you out there, if you want to get better looking, okay, quit alcohol. Well, I mean, or if you don't want to say get better looking, just keep drinking alcohol because it shows up in your face, right? It's a poison, the toxins. It's true. And so you look weathered, you get crow's feet, the wrinkles in your forehead um, start to be more pronounced. You just look old before your time. Well, you, you look, I mean, it dries you up. It sure dries you up, yeah. Um, one thing that, that I think. Even even for people who are going to drink, I think you massively underestimate the amount of water you need to replace what you're dehydrating yourself of. Right. Um, I don't drink a lot, but when I do drink, I load up water beforehand and afterhand. So mm -hmm. and, and afterwards. So and Sarah and I do this too, where we will if we're going to drink that night, we might drink a gallon of water first, right. and then we might have our drinks, which is we'll have a few drinks, and then we'll just massively load the water afterwards. Right. And that for me has prevented any hangovers. I don't get hangovers anymore, and I. And I, in the past, I have experienced just the, I mean, have you ever woken up from a night of drinking and your, whole, your lips are just 
just this tight, chapped, yeah. like just dry, crusty face. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah. oh, what's going on? I look yeah. miserable. Yeah. You know, I looked great last night, and I look miserable now. Yeah. And your breath just feels like dragon's it's breath nasty. and just gross, man. Nasty. And you're like, your muscles are real sore, but it's not because you worked out. It's because you just feel like shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not a pleasant feeling. It's not. And the thing is, you can have so much fun the night before just by drinking water or non-alcoholic drink. Yeah. And then you, the beautiful thing is you wake up the next day, and because you've been drinking water mostly, you're refreshed, you're hydrated, your skin looks good, you've got energy, you've got clarity, and then you can seize the day. Yeah, I think that's, I think, I think that's uh, something that we were talking about before we started rolling was uh, you get so wrapped up in the culture of needing to have a drink that you don't even get a choice as a young adult to decide if that's the best thing for you. Well, it's ingrained in you in your mind from from a very young age. It's like a rite of passage that yeah. when you turn eighteen, you you know, and, in yeah, Australia, in Australia, <laughs> anyway, yeah, have a beer, son. You know, there you go, mate. Have some, have you know, twenty first birthday party, drinks. Yeah, there's lots of drinks. Lots of drinks. Oh, there's a wedding, champagne, mm-hmm. romantic dinner. Oh, must have a bottle of wine. Yeah, have a can, a candlelight. Now this is all fine, right? But who ever said? that you need the bottle of wine to have a romantic candlelit dinner? Whoever said you need champagne to toast the celebration? Whoever said that you need alcohol to be to be part of a tribe? You do not need it. But it's ingrained in our society, it's ingrained in our culture by clever marketing companies who are always trying to, 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 to reinforce this idea that if you want to fit in, and if you want to be part of the community, and you want to have pleasure and fun in your life, then you must be drinking alcohol. But I challenge that. You can have fun, you can create pleasure, you can have amazing experiences without the alcohol. There's a billboard up on Sunset Boulevard at the moment. George Clooney has released a tequila brand. And he's there on a motorcycle, he's got a black leather jacket, and he's looking really cool. Badass. And, and you look at this, I'm studying this billboard, I'm looking at it going, so what that billboard is essentially telling you is that if you want to be cool, like George Clooney, ride a motorcycle and be rock and roll and just be handsome and have your shit together, then you should be drinking this tequila. But why the hell do you need the tequila to be wear a black leather jacket and ride a mo- motorcycle and be cool? You don't need it. So psychology, man, just links them together. That's the psychology, you know? It's the same thing with, like, pool parties, you know, the hotels in Vegas trying to get you to come and stay at the hotel. you got girls in bikinis with uh, glasses of champagne or wine. You've got guys with beers, young, attractive people standing around, imagery of them drinking, right? Having a good time. As as if to suggest, well, if you want to have a good time, you have to drink. You don't need it. I've been having a a great time for five and a half years with girls in bikinis (laughs) while sipping on water. They probably thought it was vodka sometimes. No, I mean, sometimes they do, but sometimes, you know, most of the time they're like, oh, you don't drink. Some people are going, oh, you're an alcoholic. Other people are like, really? Tell me about it. Other people are like, eh, I don't care. Whatever. I don't care. Yeah. Now, now here's, a, here's a question that I'm wondering. Is there any value in having like an altered state? Alcohol makes things a little bit funnier, you get a little bit happier. Is there any value in feeling like that? Is there any value in feeling yeah. what you feel when you drink alcohol? Yeah, the good stuff. Okay, so the good stuff that you are alluding to is temporary pleasure, right? And right. here's the thing. It's not even pleasure. I'm going to explain this. Just give me one minute to explain this, right? So, when you drink alcohol, you get you think that you get this 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 pleasure, but all it is is relieving you of your withdrawal. Mm. So let me let me not try and explain this. Alcohol is a poison, right? It's a toxin, right? When you drink that regularly, even if you're just a social drinker, okay, your body then craves more of it because it is a poison. It's a toxin, right? It's a drug. Your body craves more of that drug. So when at the end of the day, when you're tired and you're like, oh, I would really do with a beer, I'd love to smash a beer right now. It's not because the beer makes you feel good. It's because you're trying to relieve yourself of not feeling good. And you want that beer to relieve your craving for the beer. So then when you drink it, you're like, oh, you get this temporary kind of little boost and you go, oh, right. And now you think that the beer tastes good. You think the beer gives pleasure. But it's, all it's doing is just relieving you of your withdrawal, relieving you of your craving. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So... People who never drink, or people who quit or reduce, they don't have that craving. They don't have that need for pleasure because they don't have the drug in their system. It's not, it's not calling them to drink. Um, the, uh, let me tell you this. Five and a half years I haven't drunk, I've had more pleasure physically, emotionally, 
party and going out there not drinking than I, than I had in the 10 years before drinking. I had some great times drinking. It was fun. I'm not saying give up drinking forever. I'm just saying reduce or quit for 30 days. See how amazing you feel. And then, you know, choose what you want to do after that. It's a good point. Uh, I don't know if you know Ryan Holiday's a fighter. Yeah, sure. The obstacle is the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He made a good. He made a good point uh, that he said because he he also doesn't drink for yeah. similar reasons. Yeah. And um, he made a good point where he said that if you look at it objectively, alcohol doesn't taste good. I mean, I mean, think about the first sip you ever had, Daniel. Do you ah, remember it? Horrible. Hated it. So look how your body just recoiled there when you imagined it, right? It's miserable. It does not taste good. Same way with coffee. Now I love it. There you go. <laughs> it I need it. <laughs> It doesn't taste good the first time, yeah, right? Like it's actually it's a foreign substance that, that we shouldn't be drinking. It's gross. Right? It's gross. But what happens is because it's a drug, we build up a tolerance for it. Our body starts to crave it because as the drug leaves the system, it leaves you wanting more of the drug to satisfy yeah. it, right? And so then it just becomes like, oh great, oh wonderful. I mean, have you really have you drunk scotch straight? It's disgusting. It's terrible. It's terrible. But you see all these people drinking it and going, oh yeah, it's beautiful. Because all it's doing is relieving them of the craving. Yeah. I'll tell you one other thing, this, which is fascinating. Did you know that it takes four to four and a half minutes for the brain even to register that you've had alcohol? So if you drink a sip of it or have a glass or whatever, you're on the clock four and a half minutes before the brain even recognizes that you've just had alcohol. That's how long it takes to go to the system. So all these people who are like, oh my God, I need a drink. And they take a big sip and they put it in and they go, ah, oh, oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> Yeah. It's a massive placebo it's effect. Mental. It's all mental. It's all mental yeah. because the brain doesn't know that you've had the alcohol. It takes four and a half minutes. Yeah. All these people are like, oh yeah, I need a drink, need a drink. Oh, it's the same thing relax. with caffeine. You know, I will drink one sip and be like, I'm up, I'm alert. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't work like that. No. You know, it's 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 like a bloodstream yeah. system issue where you, you need a few minutes for it to work in. But as soon as I taste the bitter coffee in my mouth, I associate it with feeling alert. Yeah. And then my brain produces the effect of feeling alert. Right. You know, which is interesting, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, the more I study health and psychology and things like that, the more I realize everything that we think is right is wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything that we've been told has been ingrained into our head about culture and stuff is wrong. It's, it really is. It's like, I remember growing up in Australia, 18th birthday party, get a whole lot of beer, 4X beer, drink, get drunk, throw up. I remember throwing up on my 18th birthday party. I'm drinking half a bottle of Zambuca. <laughs> you know that li licorice thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I remember I was wearing my Bon Jovi t-shirt at oh the time. Oh, my God. I'm vomiting all over myself. I remember my mother standing on top of the stairs of the house where I was having it, watching her son vomit into the, over himself and into the bushes saying, Oh, proud. James. Oh, James. You know, like... like what? Well, I'm so proud. <laughs> but what is the point of it? Like, what's the point? I didn't have a, a good time, but everyone's like, Yeah, James threw up. Well done, mate. Yeah, good on you. Whoa, all right. Oh, alright. And then the next day I was like, James was sick last night. All right. What a great party. No, it wasn't. It was shit out. <laughs> and I was vomiting all over uh, all over my Bon Jovi shirt, which I love. <laughs> I love that shirt now. But like society says, that's what you should do. That's true. You know, if you look at if you if you zoom out too and you look at society and you just we're kind of just little 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 apes, man, little ants, and we kinda of just if you look at it look at us objectively, we're pretty like we're pretty, we're pretty ritualistic and we're pretty like, we don't really always pay attention to what we're doing. We kind of just do things without... We're sheep. Yeah, without thinking why we're doing them. Right, you because know? the rest of the herd, if we're a sheep, is we just follow the rest of the herd. Yeah. You know, even like the courting process in America, it's like the, how you date someone here. You invite them out, you pick up a girl, you take them to dinner, you sit opposite one another. That's a very ritualized courting process, yeah, yeah. right? Um, is it different from Australia? In Australia, it's more relaxed and chilled, and you, you don't. It's not so much you're sitting across having dinner. You might go for a walk, or you might do an activity together. Whereas here, it's very much like um, the, the girls, the prize, and there's this whole kind of like ceremonial thing where you you ask them out, and then you pick them up, and then you sit them down, and then you have the interrogation interview. Yeah. You know, where you're facing one another in an adversarial kind yeah, of yeah. Tell me about your family. And, yeah. You know. And so that's a culture, like that's a culture. It's interesting, you know. It's um, and even even you know even down to the fact that you know a, a man should be the one courting woman is to, is a cultural thing as well, right? right? Yeah. Like it's just it's inherently in our in our in our brains. Uh, I like it that way, by the way. I'm not challenging that, but I'm just using it. I like to be the one who's pursuing and chasing. But I'm just illustrating the point that um, th these things don't naturally come to us. Like culture and society and trends dictate our behavior. 
but you really have to look at does your behavior serve you yeah, you know is it right. really serving you and then you've got to be strong enough to break free from societal pressure break free from the herd and really you know forge your own path this is something that i talked about with mark um and it's a good place to kind of tie it all up talking about self-awareness mm -hmm. um self-awareness is probably one of the most valuable traits that you can develop and it doesn't come overnight you have to work at developing your self-awareness mm -hmm. uh, what what's uh, maybe an insight that you've learned over the past few years uh, that you could uh, tell our viewers about becoming more self-aware how can we become more self-aware well I actually took my first psychotherapy uh, lesson last week and nice. I'm going to be doing my second one t tomorrow psychotherapy is just one form of uh, like a psychiatrist if you like they can't prescribe medication, but you just, you know, you talk to someone, you just have, have a conversation. That was really therapeutic, I have to say, just in one hour. And all she really did, this, this, this woman, was ask me questions. She didn't really comment on it, she just asked me questions. But the questions that she asked me brought up certain answers which made me think in a certain way. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, everyone should go and do psychotherapy. What I am saying is the quality of understanding, your ability to understand yourself comes down to the quality of the questions that you ask yourself or somebody else asks yourself, okay? So, for example, um, uh, you know, if you write down on a piece of paper, you know, what are my strengths? What, am I, what, what do I love about myself? And you write down, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm handsome, I'm fit, I'm creative, I'm intelligent, I'm such and such. Like, you will feel amazing about yourself if you believe that stuff. If you say any of those words and you don't believe it, well, you've just got amazing insight into your life, right? And now you can go and work on that. Um, likewise, if you're in a problem in your life, like, oh my God, I'm not making enough money. I'm only making like $15 an hour or 20 grand a year. Or I can't support my kids. Or I can't, can't get this business going. You can sit there and ask yourself one question, which is why. Why is this happening? Why is this not working? Or you can be a master questioner and ask yourself, who am I going to reach out to for advice? Uh, what am I going to do right now in this moment to get out of the situation? How am I going to get out of this situation? When am I going to do it? This is very forceful. Well, I'm trying to make the point. Like it's, <laughs> but like if you just sit down with a whiteboard or a pen and paper and you just go, who, what, how, and when? Just ask yourself those four questions. Um, the answer comes to you. Like the answer out of any situation comes to you. And all you need to do is just ask yourself those questions, right? So becoming, coming back to being self-aware, ask yourself the questions like, what am I doing currently that's getting me this result? What do I have to do to change this result? How many times am I going to do it? Who am I going to talk to? And then maybe have someone else, you know, ask, reach out to people and say, hey, what are three of my strengths and what are three of my weaknesses? Let's play, let's do the game right now. I'll, I'll do it to you, Daniel. Okay. All right. So, so let's start with the positive, right? Gosh. What are three things? Brag about yourself for a second here. Like try and um, you know call it like a all right brag Wednesday. What's three things that you admire about yourself? Three things I admire about myself. Um, uh, I'm a very consistent person. So once I commit to doing something, I'm really good at doing it, even when I don't want to. Right. So I'm very good at that. Uh, I'm very good at at motivating other people. You know, so I can like I can get. A vision that I have and then get other people to also see that vision and then mm -hmm. push that forward whether it's for a business or for a personal reason mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm really good at um, uh, I'm really good at, um, at at trying to trying to go against the grain of, of trends so I can look at something and say I don't like it like that but I can think of a better way to do it and then I can actually have success with that model right so I'm very good at that yeah terrific yeah. okay so now you're you're becoming even more self-aware right right and now you've put it out publicly, you've said it to me, you've said it to your listeners and the viewers and the people in the room, right? I'm sure that was a little bit awkward. Wasn't and you it? on Periscope. <laughs> so now, you're, you're, now you've got those three things, right? So okay. they're great, three great strengths that you've verbalized, and now you can build on those strengths, right? So if I was to ask you, like, uh, what do you consider three, three weaknesses okay. of yours? What are three weaknesses of yours? Attention to detail. Okay. Um, I... I tend not to care too much about small details. I just think big picture a lot of times. So I don't, you know, things like grammar, I'm, I'm pretty good at that stuff, but I don't, I don't, I don't get things perfect. Okay. So I need to have people help me with that. Okay. Um, timeliness. Timeliness, okay. Man, 15 minutes late for everything. Okay. I blame my mother. Okay. Uh, and, um, oh, what's another one? Uh, 
pretty selfish at times. Selfish? Pretty selfish. Yeah. And then, then I'll, I'll use my own psychology to say that it's best for people around me, but it's really for me. Okay. You know? Okay. Thank you for being honest. Let's just let's deal with the second one just as an example. It's a simple case. You're late, right? You're, right. you're always late. Okay. So let's do become a master questioner, right? Let's go how, what, who, and when. Okay. So how are you going to improve, improve this, this lateness? Well, let's start with the what. What yeah. what can you do to improve your tardiness? I can. So if I'm if I'm trying to arrive somewhere at a specific mm -hmm. time, um, there are two there are two clocks that I have in my head. One is the clock that is the is the supposed amount of time it will take, whether it's a Google Map yeah. or I'm just routing it in my head. Mm -hmm. Another is the clock that. I, how much time I really know it's going to take. Okay. And in order to sometimes delay having to leave or stop whatever I'm doing, I will ignore the clock that I know it's really going to take and I'll leave. And then, this is interesting, and then I will get mad at Google or traffic or anything else because it's supposed to only have taken 20 minutes. Look at the map. That's what it says. I can't believe it took me 45 minutes. Instinctively, you knew it was going to take longer. I knew it was going to take longer. Okay. But then I will purposely delay leaving or stopping because, and then I'll, then I'll say, well, if I'm late, I was going on traffic. So what could you do to change that? I mean, I think I have to start listening to my first, my, the first inkling that I have. And also, trying to stop the, let, let's say I have to meet somewhere at noon. Why do I have to arrive right at 12 o'clock? Why can't I arrive at 11.45? Okay. So that's good. So you've got some ideas. You've got some insight, right? Yeah. Now, what are you going to do to ensure that that happens next uh, time? There's a few things. One, um, knowing my own psychology, put some padding around times. So if I see a time like 11:30, yeah, for me in my head I should start thinking 11 o'clock. Okay. You know, so changing changing my own time frames. And then the second one is, I have this weird thing where like I, like, if I'm getting ready to go somewhere, you're really digging into my. I haven't thought about this a lot. If I'm if I'm getting ready to go somewhere, I think maybe it's like an avoidance thing where. If I have to be somewhere at 12 and it's 11.30 mm -hmm. and I should be walking out the door right now, I'll see a dish or something in my house that needs to be like straightened up. And I'm like, well, let me just go straighten that up real fast. I can mm -hmm. just, I don't want to come back to a dirty house. Let me just straighten that up. And I'll spend 10 to 15 minutes straightening up that dish and then I'm in a rush. Yeah. Fuck. Right. So I need to not be distracted by the little things because I think that there's like some sort of avoidance or resistance to, mm -hmm. to doing activities. And, and, and I try to distract myself with other things. Okay. So who are you going to get to hold you accountable on this? Or who can you talk to about further on this? Who can hold you accountable on this? I, th I think it has to be my girlfriend. She's living with me 24-7 and she sees me do this and she points it out. Okay. She's so what conversation are you going to have with your girlfriend? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to? <laughs> uh, I think I just need to tell her, like, look, I'm we're, we're not going to be late because of this mental block I'm having anymore. So when we're getting ready to go somewhere, don't let me be distracted. Because she'll even do this thing now where I'll say, all right, babe, we're getting ready to go. We're getting, we're getting, we're getting ready to go right now. We're getting ready to go. And she'll go put on her shoes and she'll be at the door. And then she'll see me do other stuff. She'll sit down and be like, I'll just wait. And while I'm running around, like picking up clothes and doing stuff, she's like, are we going to go? What are you doing? So at that point, she needs to be like, you're not, you're not putting that away. You're going. We're going right now. Okay. So you're going to have a conversation with her. When are you going to have a conversation with her about this? Can you text her, Daniel? <laughs> When I get home. Okay. I have to. What time did you get home today? Fuck, man. We're really getting specific here. Uh, well, specific. Like, you cannot hit a target you don't see, yeah, right? I'm gonna so, get... good. But we got to get specific. I'll be home at 6.30. Uh, so, well, that's what time you'll be home. But what time will you have the conversation Fuck, with man. you? Uh, I mean, she, uh, 7? At 7 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. And then at 7.30, who are you going to text to tell that you had the conversation with her? James Swan. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so... Fuck. So now we've gone from, okay, now you're self-aware, right? Oh, it's too, I don't like it, it's creepy. Okay. Well, sorry, I didn't mean the trip. No <laughs> we'll call it a day. We'll call it a day. No worries at all. It feels so, it feels, I feel too vulnerable and aware. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You, you've, you've just become 